Hello, Americans. I'm Paul Harvey, and this is the testing time. We are being tested, you know, you and I, individually and collectively. The test isn't going to be all fun or all easy. But if you'll hear me out, I think you'll agree you wouldn't want it any other way. Such a little while ago, we sat around in our councils of men, chewing our fingernails up past the elbow, worrying about the hideous force which man had loosed on the world when he unharnessed the atom. Now, looking back, we can see that the nuclear weapon was a disguised blessing. We're outnumbered by our potential enemies, seven to one. War with bayonets, we couldn't win. The big bomb was the equalizer, which cut the limitless hordes of Asia down to our size. This awesome weapon stood between us and slavery. And now we can see that an all-wise almighty entrusted this hideous instrument to our tiny fraction of the Earth's population first. Not for our destruction, but for our deliverance. Our problems are not new ones. What are our problems? Death, war, and taxes. Well, there's nothing new about the first of these, nor about wars, hot or cold. Wars never end. Cain clobbered Abel with about a four-pound club, and men have been fighting ever since. The only difference being that with each succeeding generation, the foot-pounds of destructive energy which one man can deliver increased through the development of the crossbow, the catapult, gunpowder, and the automatic weapons, and the cannon, the airplane, the bomb, the blockbuster... For thousands of years, the line on the chart measuring the foot-pounds of destructive energy which one man can wield goes up in a slow, steady incline until August 1945. And suddenly the line on the graph shoots for the stratosphere, for then there'd been thrust into the hands of man a weapon 400 million times more lethal than anything ever before. This has changed the complexion of war, but wars never end. In the Three and a half thousand years of recorded history, fewer than eight percent of those years have been warless ones, and even in this eight percent of the time between, the wars between the wars, which we have come to call Cold Wars, went on. Nor is there anything new about these. Quintus Fabius Maximus, the Roman general, was the original Cold War kid, I guess you could say. The Romans nicknamed him the Conctator, meaning one who delays. He marched and countermarched. He turned the battlefield into a parade ground, but he wouldn't fight. Hannibal's getting ulcers, but he isn't getting shot. They say one day old Fabius met the Carthaginians on the field of battle and he said dramatically, well, what will it be, war or peace? And they said by that time they were so bush chasing him around didn't make much difference one way or the other. So he said, then let it be war. And with a dramatic flourish, he flung his toga to the ground and ran as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Now, there's nothing new about wars, hot or cold. Cold wars are waged by the forces of espionage and counter-espionage. And history demonstrates that who wins this war between the wars generally determines who gets the drop on whom when somebody blows the whistle on a shooting match. Now, however, with the major world powers armed with weapons of annihilation, it is possible that for the first time in history, the cold war between the wars may be perpetuated. You see, when you and I were boys, we used to resolve our differences as boys with our fists. And generally, you or I would come home with a black eye or a bloody nose, but the difference was resolved. We don't do it that way anymore. Nowadays, though, we try to pretend to our wives that we have some nobler motive. The fact of the matter is that the only reason we don't fight with our fists anymore is that we are so increased in size and physical prowess, we've become so strong in the arms and so soft in the tummy that if we were to wage combat, somebody might get badly hurt. Maybe somebody might get killed. It just wouldn't be worth it. So now we resolve our differences by more moderate means. Americans, it's the judgment of most thinking men that the great nation states of the world have now approached such a position of physical strength, physical prowess, that none will dare to attack the other. If the initiation of the armed conflict is in itself a suicidal act, then a military standoff might conceivably be perpetuated and doomsday postponed indefinitely. This, however, presupposes that we're going to keep us strong. That's us, spelled U.S., strong in our arms and in our hearts. Now then, what makes a nation strong? Taxes? <laughs> There's nothing new about those either. The first income tax was paid by Abraham was written on a rock by the hand of divinity and handed to Moses at the top of Mount Sinai. And you might want to remember this. It was at the flat rate of 10%. It promised the wrath of God on anybody who tampered with or violated that law. Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. Joseph was a relatively well-to-do landowner of the house and lineage of David. 
Yet the taxes exacted by Caesar Augustus were so exorbitant that he didn't have enough money left over to employ a trusted messenger for the mission, so though his wife was great with child, he made the journey himself. And Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. And Christ was born in a manger because there was a housing shortage when he got there. Our problems are not new. At Runnymede, the Magna Carta was handed to King John on the end of a sword denying to royalty the right of unlimited taxation. Yet you know it was for us, the American people, to become the first in recorded history ever voluntarily to surrender our rights to private property. Oh, yes, we did. With an innocent-sounding constitutional amendment, the 16th, which says that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived. And we forgot to put any limit on the extent to which we could tax ourselves. Conceivably, we could be taxed out of all private property. We could be taxed not... 70%, 80%, 90%, but 100%. We could awaken one morning and find that the government owns the farm and the house and the car and has a mortgage on the church, legally. Historically, whenever any nation has taxed its people more than 25% of their national income, initiative was destroyed and that nation was headed for economic eclipse. Presently, the American people are being taxed 33% of their total income. History says we'll roll forward on momentum for a little while, but we'd better get some more gas in the tank pretty quick. You see, ours is not the first by George good government to arise on the world stage. There have been several. Rome, Spain, and Greece, and China, and each enjoyed about 150 years at its zenith. That's just about our time in the New World. And then each decayed away. Not one of them was ever destroyed by anybody else's marching legions. Each rotted away, morally, socially, culturally, economically, simultaneously. You know, one of the most cruel paradoxes of history is this. Because each was a good government, it bore bountiful fruit. And when it bore bountiful fruit, the people got fat. And when they got fat, they got lazy. And when they got lazy, they began to want to absolve themselves of personal responsibility and turn over to government to do for them things which traditionally they had been doing for themselves. At first, there appears to be nothing wrong asking government to perform some extra service for you, but if you ask government for extra services, government, in order to perform its increasing function, has to get bigger, right? And as government gets bigger, in order to support its increasing size, it has to what? Tax the individual more, so the individual gets littler. And to collect the increased taxes requires more tax collectors, so the government gets bigger, and in order to pay the additional tax collectors, it has to tax the individual more, so the government gets bigger and the individual gets littler. And the government gets bigger, and the individual gets littler, until the government is all-powerful. The individual is hardly anything at all. The government is all-powerful, and the people are cattle. Now, some believe that the need is for a vigorous, strong man to arise on the scene to regulate and regiment the affairs of men. Yet history tells us there have been several such. Once upon a time, there was a nation great and powerful and good. She was suffering from the aftermath of war, from a depression. And then came upon the scene a leader, an idealist, self-confident, intolerant of criticism. Wisely, he limited his early activities to combating the financial depression. Nobody could argue with that. But in a while, he began to regulate business and establish new rules to govern commerce and finance. Some of them in diametrical disagreement with the God-made laws of supply and demand, but anybody who disagreed with those new rules was promptly fired. The new leader saw that under the old system of free enterprise, landlords prospered, so he levied new taxes to take away their profits and destroy what he called the monopoly of capital. To please laborers, he controlled prices. To win the favor of the farmers, he gave them loans and subsidies. The national debt mounted alarmingly. Whenever anybody tried to tell him that governments, even as people, can go broke when they spend beyond their incomes, he said they just didn't understand deficit finance. Well, what do you say? Did he build on rock or on sand? I say on sand. For you see, this was the story of Emperor Tsu Tung Po, who led China to its doom more than a thousand years ago. And I am as satisfied with all my heart that if Uncle Sam ever does get whipped, here too, it will have been an inside job. It was internal decay, it was not external attack that destroyed the Roman Empire. 
Starting about 146 B.C., internal conditions in Rome were characterized by a welter of class wars and conflicts, street brawls, corrupt governors, lack of personal integrity and moral responsibility. About 290 years after Christ, a Roman emperor named Diocletian took over. He really grabbed the bull by the horns. He took over in a period of turmoil and severe depression. The first thing Diocletian did was call in the gold and close the banks and raise the taxes. He reduced the power of the Senate, delegated its power to a lot of little government bureaus. Do you know they even had a transportation act back there prescribing the fee required to rent one laden ass per mile? And at today's rate of exchange, it would have amounted to about one-eighth cent per mile, which meant that in order to make a profit, a jackass would have to carry five passengers? That was simply beyond the capacity of the jackass. Diocletian put millions of people on the public payroll, but when this failed to do the job, the country was still in trouble. He asked more personal powers for himself. For a brief while, incidentally, they were standby powers, but then he used them all at once. He froze wages, he froze prices, he froze jobs, he stopped profits, he dictated to the farmer what he should plant, when and how he should sell it, and for how much, and he rationed food. And what happened? The labor market closed down. Incentive was gone. Farm life became dependent on bureaucratic red tape. Exorbitant taxes cost the farmer his land. He kept for himself only a small plot on which he might grow turnips for his family. He lost the rest of it to the state. And without food and with incentive gone, city life stagnated and declined. And Rome passed into what history has recorded as the Dark Ages, lasting a thousand years. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. A nation would evolve from a monarchy into an oligarchy, from oligarchy to dictatorship, from dictatorship to bureaucracy, from bureaucracy to pure democracy, where finally the people would cry out from the chaos and confusion of the streets, oh, please, God, give us a king, and God would give them a king, and they'd have a monarchy again and start the whole silly cycle anew. Now, either we will profit from the errors of their ways, or it follows as the night, the day, our children are going to have to relive the Dark Ages all over again. We can perpetuate the military standoff. We can delay doomsday indefinitely. We can continue on the high road that's made our United States the powerhouse of the world. But again, it isn't going to be all fun. But then nothing worthwhile ever is. If we intend to stay strong enough to enforce peace, let us determine first the source of our strength. How come, after thousands of years of experiment, our new nation has come so far, so fast? All this in less than 200 years. What is the secret of our success? Well, I think it had to do with a basic American's creed. Perhaps it never passed the pioneer's lips in this form, but if it had, I think he would have said something like this. I believe in my God, in my country, and in myself. I know that sounds like a trite too simple thing to say, and yet it's a rare man today who will dare to stand up and say, I believe in my God and my country and in myself, and in that order. When the early American pioneer first turned his eyes toward the West, there were only Indian trails or traces, as they were called, for him to follow through the wilderness. Do you know today you can roller skate from Miami to Seattle, from San Diego to Plymouth Rock? In this little bitty instant, as historical time is measured, our 7% of the Earth's population has come to possess more than half of all the world's good things. How come? Well, sir, when that early pioneer turned his eyes toward the West, he didn't demand that somebody else look after him. He didn't demand a free education. He didn't demand a guaranteed rocking chair at eventide. He didn't demand that somebody else take care of him if he got ill or got old. There was an old-fashioned philosophy in those days that a man was supposed to provide for his own and for his own future. He didn't demand a maximum amount of money for a minimum amount of work. Nor did he expect pay for no work at all. Come to think of it, he didn't demand anything. That hard-handed pioneer just looked out there at the rolling plains, stretching away to the tall green mountains, and then lifted his eyes to the blue skies and said, Thank you, God. Now I can take it from here. Now, that spirit isn't dead in our country. It's dormant. It's been discredited in some circles, driven underground, but it isn't dead. It's just that a few seasons ago, politicians baiting their hooks with free barbecue and trading a Ponzi promise for votes began telling us, we don't want opportunity anymore. We want security. We don't want opportunity, they said. We want security. 
They said it so often we came to believe them. We wanted security. And they gave us chains, and we were secure. Suddenly, with our constitutional guarantees depleted, with our national character eroding away, with our tax laws penalizing those who dare to prosper, with workers concentrating on how little they can get by with instead of how much they can produce, suddenly we looked overhead one day to discover that the first tin moon in space was a Russian accomplishment, that free men dragging their feet had been outdistanced by slave workers dragging their chains, and we were sore afraid. But as with the nuclear bomb, perhaps this was a disguised blessing too. Maybe a dramatic accomplishment by this Cold War adversary was necessary to get us off our dead centers and back to work again. If we can revive in ourselves, then in our youth, something of that basic American's creed, the horizon has never ever been so limitless. For man stands now on the threshold of his highest adventure of all, his first faltering footsteps into space. Twenty years from today, half of the products you will be using in your everyday living aren't even in the dictionary yet. We've got it made. If we just keep on keeping on, we've got it made. And if we don't, we will follow those other great nation states of history into the graveyard of ignominious oblivion. History promises only this for certain. We will get exactly what we deserve. You see, storms are part of the normal climate of life. I've not promised you a horizon of no work and all ease, all honey and no bees, because storms are a part of the normal climate of life. Sometimes the storm takes the shape of an economic catastrophe or a military holocaust or a prolonged drought or a terrifying flood. But storms are a part of the normal year-in, year-out climate of life. We sometimes think our generation has been especially discriminated against. But in every generation, young folks have wondered whether they should pursue an education or take the easiest possible way, whether they should enter the professions or not. Young folks have wondered whether they should marry or no. Young marrieds have wondered whether they ought to bring babies into an era of regulation and regimentation. In every hour of history, there have been these questions, the same as we have today, because there have always been storms to, to test men. Americans, a paradise is being prepared somewhere, a perfect place. Don't you see? We've got to prove here we deserve to be there. And if there were perpetual sunshine, there'd be no victory. So storms are a part of the necessary climate of life. This is the shakedown cruise. Here's where we separate the men from the boys. If you and I conceivably could roll out a plush carpet on which our youngsters could walk off into a problem-free future, don't you see it would not be to their best interests for us to do so. They deserve a crack at this test, too. Storms are a part of the normal climate of life. There's an election going on all the time. The Lord votes for you, the devil votes against you, and you cast the deciding vote. Americans, for some reason, are being especially tested because we have been so richly blessed with the bounteous good things which invite sloth. Storms are a part of the normal climate of life. But what happens to a rooster in a storm? He goes over in a corner of the hen house and gets soaking wet and shivers and shakes and develops what is it, coccidiosis or pip or one of those things roosters gets and dies. But what happens to an eagle in a storm? He sees the dark clouds. He sees them coming. But did you know this? The eagle, when he sees the dark clouds out there on the horizon, takes off and lets the tremendous storm winds in the vanguard of the turbulence actually help buoy him aloft and help him. I mean the winds, the storm winds themselves are lifting the eagle until finally he is soaring above the storm in the sunshine. That's the answer, American. Storms are a part of the normal climate of life. We've got to learn to ride them. If, however, you do not share my personal conviction concerning this testing time, I mean, if the gravy train running three sections and the factory whistles summoning three shifts are creating too much din for a still small voice to be heard, let us nonetheless, with the conscience of reasonable men, 
preserve and protect and defend this last great green and precious place on earth against all its enemies, foreign and domestic, so help us God. If only because so many people you never knew have broken their hearts to get it and to keep it for you. Once upon a time there was an old hermit in the hills of Tennessee always used to be able to answer any questions that the youngsters of the community would bring to his hillside cabin. He was a wise old man, but in every community there is one scalawag, one borderline delinquent, one of those always getting himself into trouble, always leading others astray, and there was one such in this community, and one day he gathered his cohorts about him. He says, fellas, I have an idea how we're going to fox that old man up on the mountain. He thinks he's so smart. I'm going to catch me a bird, and I'm going to hold it in my cupped hands. And I'm going up to his cabin, and I'll say, what have I here, old man? He'll guess right, he always does. He'll say it's a bird. But then I'm going to say, is it alive or is it dead? If he says it's dead, I'll let it fly away and prove him wrong. If he says it's alive, before I show it to him, I'll crush it to death. Youngsters caught a small bird and went up to the hillside cabin, rapped on the door. The old man came to the door, the lad said, What have I here, old man? The old hermit said, Why, it appears to me it's a bird you've caught there, boy. And the lad, glancing at his friends out of the corners of his flashing eyes, said, Yes, but is it alive or is it dead? And the wise old man of the mountain said, It is as you will, my son. That is the sum of it, Americans. We have here captured the elusive eagle of individual liberty. Now you can love it and feed it and watch it fly, or neglect it and starve it, and it'll die. It is as you will. The future is in your hands. Gentlemen of the press, two of our number have distinguished themselves above all others. I should like to submit their names for your consideration for our Hall of Fame. May I preface these nominations with a restatement of our responsibilities so that you may judge how these men measured up to the standards of our profession. You know an essential ingredient of good reporting in the dimensionless kingdom of news is speed. Of all commodities, ours is the most perishable. Even bananas already turning black on the push cart will sell faster than yesterday's newspaper. Every worthy scribe knows he must be accurate, thorough, and honest. But in addition to these things, he must beat the deadline. And these nominees consistently beat the deadline. Similarly, these men answer the obligatory questions of who, what, when, where, and how accurately and adequately. Their coverage of news events was competent and complete. A newsman's responsibility is sometimes terrifying. So refined has the science of news coverage become that the average American often sees storms brewing before Washington does. Our citizens are often two jumps ahead of our Congress in discerning the soundness or the silliness of proposed policy. The reason is that a thousand qualified newsmen reporting from the corners of the earth, with their reports sifted and sorted and evaluated by responsible stateside editors, Provide Americans a clean, clear window through which they may watch with 2,000 eyes the entire world. Recently, I visited the capitals and the crossroads of the Mediterranean. I was close enough to see and taste and smell the festering ulcers of the Middle East. But you know Americans at home had a more comprehensive view of what was going on than I did? From a frontline command post or a walled and guarded consulate or with forces in the field, nobody can measure the ebb and flow of political tides. A forecaster can appraise and evaluate and anticipate the weather better from a distance, relying on qualified sources in the scattered storm areas than he can from inside a thunderhead. President Eisenhower has said, I think governments are far more stupid than are their peoples. Our eyes and ears are more varied hence more reliable. 
Newsmen overseas, for example, are more highly trained, more highly paid, more free to think than are the career officers of the State Department, whose safest bet for promotion is to stay in line, march in place. Bishop Henry Knox Sherrill says there is often a blessed common sense possessed by ordinary men and women which leads them to discern between the vital and the secondary. The men and women of the United States and much of the rest of the world have learned to respect these two newsmen whose names I herewith submit, to respect their blue pencil precision, to trust their interpretation of the news stories they have covered and the relationship of those developments to the average reader. So many journalists have distinguished themselves since the days when ancient Greek runners used to bring news of coastwise shipping to their Athenian masters that the selection of two men to tower over all of those is a decision not to be taken lightly. And I will not ask for your immediate verdict, but if you will consider them and their qualifications for this supreme honor, I'm confident that you will vote these two reporters the distinction which they've earned. It must be considered to their credit rather than otherwise that both these men were part-time reporters. Actually, one of them was a physician and the other was a tax collector, and yet each found time to report with professional precision the facts in the stories he covered. Also, each incorporated in his coverage the pathos, the tears of joy and sorrow that have seasoned every human drama since Eden. I commend especially to your attention what these two men called the second chapters of their repertorial assignment. You may reread these at your leisure before rendering a decision. And the two reporters to whom I refer are the Jewish tax collector named Matthew and the Greek physician known as Luke. And the one story which each covered in his own way answers all of the primary requirements of news gathering. The who, what, when, where, and how of that memorable night when a star stood still over a stable. And in this high-speed 20th century, on a planet knitted together by vast networks of wire and wireless, the best of our efforts, yours and mine, will be pushed onto page two this next December. Still, their story will be republished for the 2,000th year on page one still ahead of the deadline. And even yet, it'll bring whole nations to their knees. I have hoped that I might live to broadcast the second coming of Christ. I was not there for the only other news event that compares the day he rose from the dead. You know the man I would like to have interviewed that first Easter day? Barabbas. Or the crucifixion day preceding, if he'd felt like talking, Barabbas. The Bible mentions him only five or six times, tells little of what he was like, but how I would have wished to follow him home that day when he, though sentenced to die, did not die. I'd like to have walked down Calvary Hill with him. Others coming from the show would have called out to him, let's stop for a drink, Barabbas, let's celebrate. But you know, as I imagine it, and the rest of this is as I imagine it, he would have waved in preoccupied recognition of the greeting and then continued shuffling along the dusty road toward his humble house. Eventually he'd turn, notice me, and he'd say, did you see it? And I would say, I saw. And he would say, how do you figure that fellow being willing to die in my place? What's his angle? And I think I'd have remained silent, let him reason it out. At the foot of the hill, Barabbas and I ducked away from the crowds, took a camel trail shortcut past rows of square houses, their flat tops strung with drying vegetables, ripening fruit, their occupants away or just coming awake between midday and mealtime. It was hot. The air was bittersweet from desert flowers and dung fires. Barabbas was like a man sleepwalking. I had never seen him like this. I had seen him leading riots and brought in for robbery, fighting, licentiousness, finally tried for murder, violent, abusive, sullen sometimes, but never like this. We had seen three men die up there on the hill. We'd seen men die before. But one of these had died in his place, and Barabbas just couldn't figure it out. I don't know what brought his wife to the door. Apparently she hadn't heard. Her cry, Barabbas, was of disbelief, not delight. Her round, tired face remained expressionless. What happened, she said. This callous, childless woman had often opened the door to her husband, drunk, fleeing, sometimes frightened, but she had long since declined to open her hurt heart anymore. And I had a fleeting feeling that she was not really glad to see him, even a little otherwise. Barabbas, she 
started to speak in that flat voice, to ask again, but instead stepped aside, and we entered, and I stood awkwardly for a moment before he indicated a bench. I sat. It was a box-like room, mud walls, divided in two parts only because the beds and the rough-hewn chest and cooking utensils were on a higher level, and there were indications that livestock shared the lower level with a work table and a loom and the bench on which I sat. At long last, Barabbas spoke. Pilot gave him a choice. A choice, said his wife, who? The crowd for Passover, the whole mob voted who should die, him or me. The priests got them all riled up and they voted him to die. I'm free. Barabbas stared at his wife and then at me. I don't think he saw either of us. And then he was talking again, not elatedly, certainly not jubilant, but an incredulous expression evolved, like a man looking at a new baby, a kind of solemn wonder. He said, this man, Jesus, they tried to get him to confess. Pilate kept asking him. All he'd had to do was confess he was not the son of God. Oh, that one, Mrs. Barabbas interrupted. Don't say that one, that way, woman, Barabbas snapped. He gave his life for me. There was a tense silence, and I dropped a large question into it. Do you think, I said to Barabbas, that he is the Son of God, the one Moses and the prophets predicted? Again, Barabbas was silent a long moment. His wife was silent, and then he said, I doubt it. Barabbas said he looked pretty much like anybody else to me, but I'll tell you something. Barabbas' eyes x-rayed mine. I'm going back up there when they cut him down. And if he gets up out of the grave like he said, if that dead man up there comes back to life, then I'm joining up with his followers. Why, I said. Because he died for me, Barabbas fired back. Ain't that enough? And besides, said Barabbas, I want to learn how he does it. And Mrs. Barabbas, her eyes somehow softer now than I remembered, walked over beside her husband, touched his hand. I'd had my interview a little later I left. It was a good story. But instead of heading toward town, I found myself walking back toward Calvary. I figured to stay with the guards and the followers. The governor had ordered an unprecedented seal on the tomb and soldiers to guard it. No man dead or alive could escape that. No mortal man. The prophets had said three days. I'd waited out. I don't know what I expected, but if he could do it, what a story. What a bio. The greatest, maybe make a book out of it. And besides, if this Jesus of Nazareth could make good, if he could die and rise again, then he'd said anybody could. And like Barabbas, I figured that was just too good a deal to pass up. I was not familiar with this shabby section of Jerusalem, and it was growing dark, but I could see the cross on the crest of the hill silhouetted against the Judean sky. I could follow that. I would find my way. Americans, I want to take you with me across an ocean and a sea to Milan, Italy, and back across five centuries, just to see a building not much bigger than your garage. But I'll be willing to bet it's a building you'll never forget. In the days when each Italian city was a separate autonomous country, the Duke, Ludovico Sforza, and his family kind of ran things in Milan, for better or worse. And the best was when they decided to give the whole city a facelifting in 1482. And in the years that followed, the Gothic city took on a new Renaissance appearance. Palaces and gardens, hospitals, parks, canals, convents. And one of these was a Dominican convent dedicated to St. Mary of Grace. At the moment when Columbus was buying ships with Queen Isabella's jewels, something important was going on in that convent. A man was stirring a concoction of egg tempera and pitch and mastic and preparing to use this stuff to paint the convent's dining room wall. Well, it's 1492. Columbus hits the beach in the West Indies and thinks he's at Fort Lauderdale, while back there in this convent, this part-time weapons inventor, architect, sculptor, painter, is climbing up and down on the scaffold, alternately appraising his work and dabbling away with this acrid-smelling imitation paint. No sooner does he finish his work than the Duchess of the Milan court, who had hired him for the job, dies, and her husband, the Duke, wants her buried in this beautiful little building, so the convent is closed. The place is reopened as a mausoleum to contain the tomb of the Duchess and later her child. Architects remodeled the place from time to time, but it remained a family mausoleum until sometime in the 17th century. And then came the Inquisition. Now the once sacred place was profaned by the inquisitors who brought their victims there and extorted confessions from them. A half century after that, the blood stains had been worn or scrubbed away. And in 1786, the Dominican monks used the building for a school. And this room became 
a dining room for the friars who then chopped a door through the painted wall into the kitchen. Now bear in mind that more than 200 years have passed since Columbus and since that part-time painter used his strange oilless paint concoction on the wall, and despite flaking plaster and greasy kitchen fumes, that original paint was still there 200 years later, when the building became, as I say, a school again. But in 1797, boom, the ugliness of war swept over the little building and Napoleon's troops moved in. The former refectory they used as a stable, the walls which had been painted 300 years before, soon stank of the sweat and dung of its animal occupants. Then one day the occupation ended, the room was emptied. The wall which had been so patiently painted three centuries and more before, now mildewed from the dampness, was scrubbed and the barn became a church again. In 1891, somebody finally got around to repainting that ancient interior. In 1894, again, the prime coat invented by the original painter was covered up. I guess it wasn't renovated again, actually, until 1935, when the little church was touched up here and there. So by 1937, there remained visible nothing of the original tempera colors. The 500 years old paint job finally, apparently, had been totally obliterated. There were three especially terrible nights for the city of Milan, Italy in 1943. Our bombers, allied bombers, had made every reasonable effort to spare churches from destruction, but during those three desperate nights, almost nothing in Milan was spared. And in the saturation bombing, the little building suffered a direct hit. The little place of worship, which had survived the merciless inquisition and the ugliness of military occupation, could not survive the devastation of allied bombs. It was a morning of mourning, never to be forgotten, when parishioners found their church, their beloved and beautiful Santa Maria della Grazia, a pile of rubble. Recently in Milan, I visited the spot. A reconstructed church stands there now, and I saw many photographs of the before and after, before the bombing and after, when timbers and mortar were piled in a grotesque, shapeless mass. Just the small cross protruded piteously from the shambles. I can't forget those pictures. The extent of that devastation, it's impossible to exaggerate. I've chased floods and fires and explosions and wars to the corners of this planet in a quarter century on the news beat, and I have never seen any single structure any further reduced to kindling. But the story of Santa Maria della Grazia does not end there. Nor does the story of the strange little part-time painter who did the first decorating job on that one-time convent, one-time school, one-time stable. His story does not end there either. This is the rest of the story. When the weeping heart-sick people of that little parish went that awful morning to the place where their church had been, they sanctified that rubble with their tears. They began to remove bits and pieces of it tenderly from around the crucifix that remained intact. They could not have handled the Christ child himself more gently than they did the pieces of wood and stone that they lifted and stacked aside. And when they had cleared that indescribable rubble, they found that of their little church, one wall still stood. The debris which had hidden it from view apparently had protected it from destruction. That one wall remained, I mean intact, and here is the strangest part of all, the original paint mixed of mastic and whatever that other stuff was, had been protected by the subsequent coats of paint. And the war that gave us the A-bomb also gave us the electron microscope and improved X-ray eyes. Now scientists can see through paint and analyze what's underneath, determining electronically the age of almost anything. So that painstakingly and over many months since, with razor blades and solvent, they have scraped and dissolved away the more recent coats of paint on that convent wall, and now the original colors can be seen, the original colors have been restored so that my family and I could stand there and see with our own tear-filled eyes the work of a man that had survived 500 years of violence and destruction. There on a wall that had sheltered cattle and troops, on a wall coated by cooking grease and cruelly desecrated by clumsy restorations and renovations, a wall with a door smashed through its middle, still remained the artistry of a man and the crude but indelible colors which he had mixed 500 years before. He would not have been embarrassed by the word miracle, nor will I be. For this can be nothing less, that here, still beautiful and intact, is the work of art that's been reproduced more than any other anywhere. 
for the picture he painted set the standard for what we believe God looked like. He painted the faces of men so accurately that the Almighty himself would not let them be erased. For on that one still standing wall of the little church in Milan is Leonardo da Vinci's indestructible Last Supper. Now you know the rest of the story. <laughs>